What? What am I doing? Yo, you think this kind of buff just happens? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Here, let me put these down. Um, what am I doing? Well, I'm kind of really trying to lure in Double Mint Gum as my sponsor. You remember Double Mint Gum? Remember the Double Mint <laughs> Twins? Yeah, I remember the Double Mint Twins about as fondly as I remember a certain part of the 1974 Sears catalog. Why am I telling you this? Well, George taught me, don't tell a lie, just let it out there. Your audience are, is going to love it. You know what, George? Abe up there thinks that's the cruelest joke anyone has ever pulled on me. Anyway, let's move along. Enough bonding. Okay, back to reality. No, you are not seeing double. There are two guitars here exactly the same, and they are Gretsch G9201 Honey Dipper guitars, steel body guitars. Now, why do I have two? Well, I'm going to tell you. First off, let's talk a little bit about steel body guitars. I told you in a previous episode, uh, I'll find it and try to remember what it was and give you a link up there. But we kind of covered that before amplification, um, the ability to project not only your voice, but your guitar was a big thing when you're playing some barrel house or some party or on the street corner trying to lure in um, potential customers for the medicine show that hired you to lure people in, a.k.a. Furry Lewis. Again, that eye up there will give you um, some information about that. Anyway, these two here are Gretsch G9201 Honey Dipper Steel Body Resonators. Now, um, I got one of these for me, and then come time for Tammy. Y'all know Tammy. That's what this is all about. Um, come her birthday, it's like, okay, Tammy's left-handed, I'm right-handed, so we want to play guitars together. One of them needed to be set up right-handed which it already was out of the factory. The other one, left-handed. Now I got These resonator guitars, the good thing about them is they'll virtually outlive you. I can take one of these and literally rake a planter bed with it. I could probably frame a house with it. I'd end up with some dents in the side of it. But there's nothing to these things. There's a neck that goes on them and a body. And as long as you don't mess with the cone, you're going to be fine. This thing will outlive you. So if there's one guitar you want for durability, sound, and something that you'll keep in the family forever, it's a steel body resonator. Now, how did I learn about this type of guitar? Tony Polcastro, um, he's got a great channel. Uh, it's about acoustic guitars. He just did an episode on his uh, episode, episode on his episode on his series, Acoustic Tuesday about buying steel body resonator guitars I think for under the price point top end was $7.99 and this one come out of it good so when it come time to buy one I got this one I was happy with it I don't play it so I don't have that much of a demand when it come time to find a second one this was clearly our choice I'm going to give you a link to that episode where Tony talked about steel body resonators and buying them at an economic price point right up there right about now so let's talk about how these things work. There's a hole in the body. You can see that. There is a resonator cone inside of that. It's pretty fragile. It's made out of metal. Uh, and it sits down in the body. And it kind of floats. It's, it's tied off up here. But the other part of it floats. Um, there is a piece of wood here that's round that sits on top of the cone. And there is a bridge that's made out of hardwood. So you've got a, a, a round circle made out of wood that floats on the top of the cone and a bridge that floats on that. And when you strum this, the wood on the, that's the bridge and the wood that supports the bridge goes down onto the cone and resonates. Now, you might have seen a can like this before in an episode called Mrs. Olson is hot. 
like today. Anyway, it kind of works like this. There's not a coffee can in here, obviously, because the body's not as thick as a coffee can, but a resonator cone is kind of like this. It's an open end and a roll and a tumble. Copyright Luther Dickinson. Anyway, so you've got a cone like this, open end. I put this piece of wood up here. If I put strings across here, when I hit the strings, it picks it up, and because this is floating, it will magnify the sound. Sound gets magnified, it goes out, it comes and hits and goes through the body, and comes out the F holes and these holes here. So that's how resonator guitars work. No amplification, it's just you hitting the guitar as hard as you can and bellowing things out being louder than the people that are loaded on moonshine in the Barrow House or whatever party you were at when Sun House was making a living before amplification. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. So I keep going on and on, which is nothing new for me. You know that. Uh, if you're a subscriber, if you're not, then you need to join my subscribers in their pain of listening to me droning on and on. But there's some good stuff coming here. Bottom line, these things come in a right-handed configuration. And on top of that, anything coming out of a factory and being bounced around and shipped here and there is probably going to have some inconsistencies that um, are going to show up when you play. So, best thing to do is to get a setup on a guitar. Now, I've talked to you about intonation, and that is, you know, we take our special stick. I always build my guitars with 25 and a half scale. That means if I put this at the back of the nut up here and look at where the 12th fret is, that would be that mark, which means I would place the bridge here. Now, let's say that this nut is a tad bit crooked or the neck is just a tad bit off or the biscuit, which is the bridge, is a tad bit off. Or let's say that the big string is a, of a different diameter than the small string. That would mean that's why they call it big and small string. And that I could measure that difference with one of these gadgets. And let's say that all things being equal and everything is perfectly straight. When it comes time for those strings to cross this bridge, where this bridge or biscuit sits on the guitar is going to matter as to whether or not your biggest string and your smallest string ring true. Now, on arch tops, you'll often see that the bridge is not sitting at a 90 degree angle, but it will be tilted a little bit. And if everything is lined up perfectly, the neck is perfectly straight, the nut is perfectly straight, everything is perfectly straight. At minimum, what you're going to find is the bridge will be tilted like so, at least the same distance as the width or diameter of the big string in comparison to the small string. So you take those two, you subtract one from the other, and that's probably the minimum tilt you're going to see. If you don't have that tilt and all things are the same coming across a rough bridge like this, your intonation is going to be off just a little bit. So when you jump and hit the 12th fret here, this is going to be a little bit uh, sharp or flat in comparison to the other strings. That's why the tilt. Sorry for the long explanation. Anyway, I didn't want to do this myself. I wanted to take the opportunity to take this to a luthier because I just told you, we're going to have these guitars as long as we're alive. And if I'm going to have somebody do the setup on one of these, it's going to be somebody notable. And do I have somebody for you? So I'm going to take these to the bench, set them up, set the camera up so you can see what it looks like inside and what was done. And you are going to be above any episodes you've seen this time, completely, utterly disamazed. Let's go to the bench. Okay, so you can hear my voice echoing out of these things, which is an indicator that they're working. But in order to set one of these up, I explained to you that the difference between here and here and the intonation and all that kind of stuff. And so our culprit, if there is any, is sitting under here. Now, this is the one that's strung up left-handed. 
and this is strung up right-handed. This is something that's going to be around forever. It's not something that I'm gluing matchbooks on and poking Texas license plates through. So um, we're going to take this off. Now, when it comes to working on these kinds of guitars, I want to make sure that if this bolt is in this hole that it stays there. So this double mint box, it's magnetic, and I can put a magnet here. So when I take the bolts off, if this one comes out of this hole, I can put it up here, this one here, and this one here. And I'll show you that in a second. So we're going to loosen these off. I don't want to lose these, that's for sure, uh, because they're built with the guitar. So you're going to take your time. And again, that one came off of the lower one. So I'm going to set it there like that. You see that? I'll take the rest of these off. Okay, notice that as I'm taking these bolts out, I'm taking some bacon-flavored toothpicks, a must-have, and putting it in to keep everything flopping around and scratching everything up or whatever. So let me get this last string or this last bolt off of here like so. I can push that like that. And as soon as I hear it click and turn a little bit, then I grab these and pull that off and again isn't that beautiful of course it is i did it okay let's zoom in just a little bit and well i got the right zoom direction this time okay here is that piece of rose wood that i'm talking about there's another kind of a piece of wood right there and this round biscuit is grooved so these things sit in there they're not just balancing on there if they were just balancing on there it would want to flip this way you want to remember that if your bridge is sitting up really high and can pivot this way that's going to throw your intonation off when you load the string this way the bridge is going to want to pull one way or another and if it's not slotted like that it's not good so you see that this bridge is tilted a little bit if you loosen these strings off this whole thing rotates because it's just sitting evenly on top of the cone. I would not expect that there would be gaps or that the bottom of this biscuit would be uh, anything other but, but than to be flat and it would make perfect contact with the cone which has a little ridge that this sits into. So in order to intonate this, if I'm loading it up, of course I want to put all the strings on and get a little bit of tension. But when I am strumming this and I put my finger on the 12th fret and do it, I would expect that there would be an intonation of one octave higher, not flat, not sharp. And in order to get that, the minimum you're going to have to do, trust me on this, is whatever the width of this string. I know I'm being redundant here, but I can take this and tune it down and figure out they have some that have digital readouts and this and because these two are different the minimum pitch you're going to get on this is this there was a lot that went into this it's not just pulling these off and turning this or whatever i've looked at this one over here let me zoom back out now oh look at that i'm cooking with fire now I've looked at this one here. The setup isn't the same. There was some work that needed to be done on the knot. You have to have the right knot files. There's all kinds of things that go with this. Or, or basically, you're doing the same thing here that you would with a knot. You're filing things. You're getting things just right. And then tuning it in. And once all of these strings intonate properly, you'll notice that I took a pencil and one of these fancy gadgets here. I'm ill-prepared, like so. And I laid it across the bridge like this and took a pencil and marked there and there and did the same thing on top and got that flat and marked there and there. So, as long as this and this line up there and there is perfect, unless something were to happen to the neck or whatever. Next thing I want to tell you is these strings, apparently that, there's a huge difference there. Of course, I could use some kind of measuring device that says 
this and this, but these strings are roto sound strings. Now, if I put a set of Ernie Balls on like I usually do, depending on if you catch them on sale, they're gonna be less than $10. These strings cost each what? Um, a set of Ernie Ball, not, not even slinkies do. But that said, why is this important? Well, you're only putting the strings on once. You're not gonna have to put these strings on very often. If you, if you play it, you know, fairly frequently, the strings are going to be okay. So what's the problem with these? Well, these are a little bit thicker right here than here. You can see that here and here. Um, the first four are wound. The other one are just plain straight steel. These here didn't fit through the same holes down here that these would have. To turn this over and drill each one of these, correspondingly enough to where it fit the string but there wasn't a lot of slop left in there for everything to be around there is a huge difference to me in how this sounds so roto sound i'm going to give you a link below that tells you how to get this in the resource section and um some records you might like played on something like this so now that I've got all my parts set, I know where everything is, I'm going to put this back together. But again, notice that I marked it with a pencil. That, of course, will be protected underneath this. And then I'm going to use my two guides instead of trying to flop all over the place. I'm going to put these in and get back to putting those on and try to tension them up just right. All right, there we go. I will tell you what, this is a prized possession. Not only will it last a lifetime, but this thing has been intonated and set up by, in my opinion, the best luthier that you could possibly meet, if not the best human being you could possibly meet. So with that, I hope you like this episode. I really like to make it, um, and it's I'm progressing on, uh, trying to move forward on these arch tops because the competition out there is steep. Guys, don't forget to give me a like and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Oh, almost forgot. This will be down in the resources section down below. But if you like uh, this kind of music, slide music on resonator guitars, Rainer Petitchik, Rainer, A-R-I-N-E-R, Rainer Petitchik, starts with a P-T. It's one of those great names that starts with a P, like my last name. Worried Spirits. This one's hard to find. It's a little bit pricey, but there's a download card in it. You want to find this one. And also, the one you can always find, not littered up with a bunch of somebody's head trip vocals, is Leo Kotke, 6 and 12 string guitar. You're going to like that. So anyway, I'll give you links to where to find those below.